Welcome to the podcast, Claim Your Excellent Life, with your host, Suzanne Kellner Zink, where she helps professional women learn how to be happy. Suzanne will teach you how to do this through building high self esteem, relaxation and calm, and good, healthy relationships. Tune in every week as Suzanne shares effective strategies to help you claim your excellent life with happiness techniques, self esteem building exercises, relationship tips, and relaxation information. Make sure to head over to dawningvisions.com to subscribe to the newsletter to receive your keys to happiness, as well as other useful free gifts for you. In this episode of Claim Your Excellent Life, we are going to talk about contraction and scarcity mentality versus expansion and abundance mentality. You know, many people think of abundance as meaning money, income. And yes, we all need to have an income to live in this monetarily based economy that we all live in. And I can assure you that this is not the most important thing that we have in life, not by a long shot. I was visiting with my youngest sister. She was helping me out as I was getting my cataract surgeries done. And the first time we were together, there was something that was off, but we got along okay. But there was still something that was off, and I really wasn't sure what it was. But I had a really bad asthma attack. And that usually means that there's toxicity somewhere in the air. <laughs> Not a good thing. And this sister of mine were really, really, really close. So it was kind of a shock to have that occur. But the second time when I went to her place, I didn't have as bad an asthma attack, but I had one nonetheless. And during that visit, it all went well until the very end when she made some very negative commentaries to me about things that I had never said to her. And I brought it to her attention and she didn't really like it a whole lot and that's okay. We were able to make up in the end, but the learning here was that, you know, she and her husband worked really, really, really hard for everything that they have for years and years and years. Doing jobs that perhaps they didn't like, commuting long distances for years, and making decent money for the most part. And the economy contracted and she lost a few really good paying jobs and he lost his job and he made a decision not to go back to work after being treated very badly in his last employment and being treated like less than nothing in the two job interviews that he went to after, I don't know, 20 some odd years in the industry that he works in. Having done quite a bit of studies in specialized areas under the company that he worked for, for years. And to tell you the truth, I don't blame him because I just had something similar happen in my own world, in the world of elder care. Two very different cases, two different companies, and both a bunch of bullshit. You know, when you go to do live-in assignments with people, you get a free place to live, which is very viable given the rents here in Connecticut, and room and board. Well, room and the board. <laughs> Food is very expensive too. I just went to Trader Joe's and spent $52 on probably the amount of food that will last, I don't know, hopefully a week, although I won't guarantee it. And so that's very valuable, but when I was on the phone with my godson, figuring out how much money I made after taxes for the amount of hours I was working, because I was on call 24-7, of course, living in there with her. So if my clients needed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, well, of course I had to be there to help them because they were... Well, risk for falls. That's why I was there. So I wouldn't fall. It came down to about $5.68 a minute after taxes. Or, I'm sorry, $5.68 an hour after taxes. And as we were talking about this, he said, you know, it's not worth it. Go do what you need to do to create what you're creating in your business. So he's going to help me do that. Because I'm giving him my business. I don't want it. I don't want to deal with the taxes, I don't want to deal with the finances, I don't want to deal with any of it, I just want to do my work. And I figure if he has the finances, he's the one who actually has a degree in business, he's also the one who has studied investments on a master's level, 
almost has his master's degree, that he'll take better care of the money if it's his than if it's mine, and I trust him completely and totally because he's the one who had my back when nobody else did. We're partners in crime, if you will. Oh, he and my friend Arthea, who also helped me out amazingly. <laughs> my tooth cracked in half and I needed dentistry, and we were able to get a really good deal from my dentist out in California so that she could make payments. And I still owe her for that. She helped me with my car problems, too, so Dorothy is another person who is, I don't know, an amazing heart-centered person. Someone that this sister of mine likes to put down because she doesn't understand how fulfilling it is to share until it hurts, as a Kabbalist would say. She has a scarcity mentality. And with that scarcity mentality, as we went to Bertucci's to have pizza, not a really huge expenditure under any conditions, I will say. It was a very good pizza. But when the waitress had told her that they had remodeled the place three years ago and that was the last time they were there, she realized, perhaps, my sister that is, the very limited life they are leading now with her husband not working and with her making less money in a place not of hedge funds, but of real estate development when the bosses are spending outrageous amounts of money for yachts, fancy houses, and even helping the daughter buy a multi-million dollar house or whatever. I don't know, all the ins and outs. But suffice it to say, they're not really paying my sister her value. And she's pretty upset about it, rightfully so. And yet I would say, given my experience helping people, and being fired twice, once by a narcissist on my birthday. Well, because there was nothing anybody did to make her happy, frankly. She was a miserable bitch anyway, so that was a gift. And then I worked in another place where the woman had had a stroke and was in rehab for three months and was giving exactly one chemotherapy for her advanced lung cancer, which I didn't even know she had until she had a slight heart attack, quote-unquote, from the ER doctors. My last day with her. Which is why she couldn't walk and could barely sit on the end of the bed any longer. She didn't belong being released home even though that was her wish. Certainly not without hospice care. And the arrogance of my boss going through all her medication saying she didn't need any of it, including lancets for her diabetes, blood testing, and anticoagulants. The woman had just had a stroke. I mean, really, truly, it was so pathetic and disgusting, I couldn't even fucking believe it, quite frankly. And a doctor who had, she had seen for over 20 years did not even tell her that he was retiring the week before he retired. And so when she collapsed in my arms as I was trying to get her down the stairs of her home to go see another doctor because she needed new prescriptions, this is when my <laughs> boss and the nurse came over to check things out. I guess they didn't read the notes I wrote saying that we were going to see this new doctor because she said she didn't see them. And I said, well, they were right in there, written explicitly everything that was going on with this particular client, as was expected. But yet she didn't read any of it. So she ended up going to the hospital. I don't know if she's dead or alive, and I don't really care, frankly, sadly to say. And then I found myself in another living situation for all of five days, and I was told by the current person who's there two days a week has been there for a little over a year as I was leaving after five days good luck they fired eight people in the last year in a month that she's worked there half hour I get out of there I get a call from my now ex-boss saying that they fired me why because I wanted saran wrap and aluminum foil down below where I could reach it instead of going on a fucking step stool to get it every time because I'm a short person or because, oh my God, I had the gall to actually not want to put greasy food that I'd cooked up fresh for her, based on her health needs. In the pots, in the refrigerator, no one told me, and that was held against me. And God forbid we should give a tip to a guy who, well, two guys actually, $10 each, to take out a solid steel 1956 dryer and put in a new one. You know, the guys don't make any money, you know, God forbid she should give a tip. And so they fired my ass, and that was that. And that's when I told my godson I've had it with elder care. These people are so trite and stupid. They didn't take any, any understanding of how a woman could get attached to a caregiver 
All we did was laugh the whole time I was there. I helped her to stop eating so much sugar she was going to put herself in a diabetic coma the way she was eating sugar. I helped her to sleep through the night, and I also helped her get rid of anxiety very simply and easily through the hypnotic techniques and who know. And yet, none of this mattered at all to those who are her family. And therefore, my people, I have to tell you that I totally understand why my brother-in-law has the ideas that he does, because you know what? Employers are assholes. I'm never going to be employed again by anybody under any circumstances ever. And thanks to my godson, I don't have to. Nope. Instead, we will continue the educational pursuits, and I will work on putting together my retreats for the medical people who are being screwed by our medical system everywhere they look. They are so depressed they are committing suicide. 400 doctors a year, 400 residents a year, because they have no say over their own lives. Seeing 20 to 40 patients a day, so I only get to see them five or seven minutes because apparently the medical industrial complex thinks that people and their health delivery should be run like a factory. They aren't even allowed to take time for their own lunches, to take care of their own bodily functions, and when they're sick, they're not allowed to take time off. And God forbid if a doctor is depressed under these slave conditions they live under, they go get help. Many of them have lost their licenses as a result. I'm not kidding. That's how fucked up our system is here in America. And the mental health people, well, I can tell you that many of them have issues that they need to still resolve. You know, it's very intriguing to me that when they go to graduate school to get their degrees, they're supposed to go through therapy, but you can tell how well the therapy works because they're still projecting their crap onto their patients, and I want them to stop doing that, like, immediately. So for those who are enlightened and want to let go of their garbage, and the doctors who actually want to learn how to own their own lives instead of being owned by this medical industrial complex, as my dad, the dentist, was able to do in his own practice, starting in 1955 to 1985 when he passed away. He had a wonderful practice. My mom made a lot of money off of that practice. Because <laughs> thank God he had his best friend, Gene Levine. They went to dental school together. He and his daughter ran that practice until we were able to sell it for $92,000 back in 1985. My own dentist bought his, my dentist that I saw after my dad passed in Massachusetts. He bought one for forty two five. I think he said, half the price. So I'd have to say we did pretty well. You see, when you're there for the people who care about you, Gene Levine and Dad, they were dentists for one another since dental school. I know, pretty amazing, huh? They're there to be counted on. So this is the message that I'd like to give to you. A life of expansion is based on doing those things that are of interest and port to you. The part of you that is the inner wisdom, your heart and your soul, guided, mission, purpose, calling in this life, built upon relationships with people who love you unconditionally, who are there to help you through the hard times as you're there to help them through their hard times without needing to be asked. You show up. This is what I've done ever since I learned hypnosis, actually before that even, because I've always understood the psychodynamics, being raised by a woman who had very severe mental health issues. But yet, I was always able to separate her behavior from her person. Because she was a very intellectual person, very intelligent, and very affectionate. Her insights sometimes were amazing. This is true of most mental ill people if you ever hang around them enough to learn. And those of you in mental health, I have this to tell you. If you think you're pulling anything over these people, you are most mistaken. I can't tell you how many of my clients in the vendor programs that I worked in were totally, totally enlightened about the difficulties and the hypocrisy and the bullshit that they had to put up with these 20-somethings that thought they knew better than these adults who had mental illness. Let me tell you something. They saw through every single one of them to the ex-drunk who had a drunk for a caregiver in one of these programs, <laughs> to my borderline personality disorder guy, Wayne, who wanted to know why the women were wearing leggings, being very sexual and sensual when he knew they didn't want to have sex with him, but whereas they were giving confusing messages, to another who understood that 
He didn't trust the 20-somethings and wanted his psychologist to come in to teach how to better deal with his issues and his paranoia. I thought it was rather enlightened, but my boss was so threatened by that idea, he squashed it. And the same boss didn't understand that schizophrenic people have confused thinking, so therefore they need help in cleaning their houses, not being told what to do, but to do it with them. It is so crazy. Totally crazy. So, please do yourselves a favor, you people in mental health. And realize that your mentally ill are much more insightful than you want to give them credit for. They see through us. And I, for one, am glad for it. We need to respect their insights and their understanding of what it is that they need to get healthy and to stop judging them because of some stupid idea that they have to be mentally ill forever. Let me tell you this, too. Through my work in hypnotism, <laughs> we don't deal with pathologies. We deal with clearing the issues. We deal with getting to the cause of the problem, what created the problem, the purpose for holding on to the problem, and giving them a compelling future of their own making so they can know that they can have happy, fulfilling lives, and I've done this for the past 17 and a half years, so I think I know a little bit about how this process is done. With those whom you all in the conventional world say are impossible to cure. I don't need to use that word cure. How about healing? How about facilitating their healing? Is that a much nicer way to go? We help them. We don't do it for them. So let's learn some humility and learn what our parts are so that we can work together for the healing of not just our clients and our patients, but for them and all the relationships attached to them as the ripples in the water when you throw a stone in go out further and further. That is the impact that we can have on people once we decide to shut up and listen to what they actually have to say to us so that we can help them to learn, grow, and move on. Because I can tell you this, anyone who spends the time with me to do the entire transformative process is able to let go of their problems. 100% of the time. I know, isn't that amazing? Drug addicts, sex addicts, anorexics, bulimics. I uh, know. Because I would suggest to you that if they don't have the thoughts and behaviors of addicts for a few years, that they too deserve to no longer be called that label. Just like we do in the physical world. When the illness is gone, it's gone. We don't have to sit there and call them that thing anymore. So how about we get with it and stop labeling people and help them to become healthy, honorable people living fulfilling, contented, happy, joyful lives. As always, I thank you for spending your time with me till next time. If you have enjoyed Claim Your Excellent Life, we'd really appreciate it if you go over to iTunes and give it a five-star review. If you have found Claim Your Excellent Life to be helpful to you, and maybe even life-altering with the information that we have shared here, and to allow us to continue this work, which we really do enjoy doing for you, you can sponsor us at patreon.com. That's spelled P as in Paul, A-T-R-E-O-N as in Nancy, dot com. Again, that's P as in Paul, A-T as in Tom, R E O N S and Nancy dot com, where there's a few different levels of sponsorship that you can choose from to help us to continue doing this work. We thank you for any assistance that you are able to give us. Thank you for listening to the podcast Claim Your Excellent Life with your host, Suzanne Kellner Zink where she helps professional women learn how to be happy. Suzanne teaches you how to do this through building high self-esteem, relaxation and calm, and good, healthy relationships. Tune in every week as Suzanne shares effective strategies to help you claim your excellent life with happiness techniques, self-esteem building exercises, relationship tips, and relaxation information. Make sure to head over to dawningvisions.com to subscribe to the newsletter to receive your keys to happiness as well as other useful free gifts for you.